<clears throat> so, let's adjust this. Okay, a little complicated, but I think, okay. So, um, but I'm, I, I thank Daniela for her very enlightening introduction because uh, she already explained many of the things that I will use, so I can go faster. I will talk about multi -fluid, a multi-fluid description of astrophysical on space plasmas. So I, I will start from the very beginning, I mean, single MHD, but then I'll move to a multi-fluid and show mostly in the next lecture um, some application. <clears throat> oh, okay, I need to... But before I actually start, because as you, as you know, we are in the Chambiashi lecture room. <clears throat> and in, many of you might wonder who Chambiashi was. And uh, it happens, as it happens, I know, because uh, he's from Argentina, from my university. So, um, oh, I still don't know how to use this. <clears throat> okay. So Chambiashi, uh, Juan Jose Jambiashi, the, 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 his friends call him Bocha. Bocha means a big head. And you can see why. He graduated in, in Buenos Aires, Argentina, just like myself, but many years before in, in 1948. And he got his PhD in, in two years later. Several years after that, he became the director of my physics department in 1966. And at the time, he had to leave the University of Buenos Aires because there was, there was a military coup, uh, as we have several of those in Argentina, regretfully. And uh, during the so-called Night of the Long Sticks, the long sticks are, you can see one here, is the method that our militaries decided to use to invite the students and many professors to leave the university at the time, and some of them also the country, like Chambiachi. <clears throat> so then he left Argentina and never came back, and he settled in Brazil. And from there, he pioneered the development of physics in, in not just in Brazil, but in the whole Latin America. He was, a, 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 some years later, he became the director of the Centro Latinoamericano de Física, which is CLAF. For several years, it, it's like a more modest ICTP uh, settled in, in Latin America. He also participated in the early stages of the ICTP itself in the early 60s. And he was part of the Scientific Council from 1987 to 1995. And uh, he was a, a bright uh, theoretical physicist. He made an important contribution to dimensional regularization in collaboration with Carlos Bolini, another. Argentinian mathematician in this case. <clears throat> so I wanted to do that <clears throat> because I, am, I feel honored to, to be able to talk at this lecture room. <clears throat> then uh, as a brief introduction, I have this, uh, this cartoon that shows uh, that you have magnetic field fields every, almost everywhere in astrophysics. And if you have magnetic fields, someone has to generate this magnetic field. So chances are that you have plasmas all over the universe. You have uh, magnetic fields in the Earth, and most of, not all of the planets, but most of them. You have heard from Lina yesterday some of magnetic effects on, on planets, <clears throat> the ionospheres and magnetospheres. Yes. What do you, what? Control, Control what? Oh, it's already full screen here. Uh, what should what else should I do? I don't know what to do because it's full screen here. Yeah, no, just full screen. Yeah. You share your yeah, the full screen. That's that. That's what we learned this morning. <laughs> yeah, that, I'll leave it that, like that. I mean, no, no big deal. You can get it. 
Okay, thank you. So you have magnetic fields in uh, on Earth, of course, and most of the planets, as I was saying. Also on the sun and on almost every star, not just like the sun, but uh, in younger stars as well. And uh, in the interstellar medium, we can measure that indirectly because of several, well, in some cases, because of, well, I, I'll go faster. Uh, you have neutron stars with very intense magnetic fields that we call pulsars. Uh, oh, great, you made it. Thank you. And uh, we should pay him for the job he's doing. And, then, <laughs> and uh, we also have magnetic fields uh, around accretion disks and turn out to be uh, very important in the focusing of these uh, jets coming out of, of many accretion disks. And also in galaxies, we know we have magnetic fields, which are tend to be uh, aligned with these uh, arms of spiral, spiral galaxies. <clears throat> so what one uh, theoretical method that you, one can use is, uh, as we have seen in most lectures, probably last week also, uh, we use MHT, single fluid MHT, which is okay if you use it properly and in the right regime, it doesn't solve any uh, old problems, of course. No, there's no theory that solves all your problems. So it's a fluid-like theoretical description for the motion of matter. Most uh, the baryonic matter, I, mean, I, I won't talk about dark matter because the, we don't even know what it is, but the baryonic matter, which is the one we observe, is mostly hydrogen. And when you uh, heat hydrogen beyond several thousand degrees, then it becomes ionized. And uh, then you have your electron pro proton uh, plasma, which is the most uh, usual to find in all of these places in the universe. Um, the large scale, the very large scale behavior of of the dynamic of this plasma is described by a fluid like like MHT, fluid like description like MHT. Uh, this fluid is uh, is made of electrically charged particles. In that regard, it's different from water. I mean, a neutral, electrically neutral fluid. And <clears throat> so these these uh, charged particles, of course, suffer electric ele external electric and magnetic fields. But not only that, since you have charges and since they are moving, then you generate a, a charge density and a, and a current that are sources for electric and magnetic fields. So your navier stokes equation for the dynamics of matter yeah. couples with the Maxwell equations. You, you, we have seen much of that during these days. <clears throat> so you, you have a more... Uh, a system of nonlinear equations, which is most of the time too complicated because you have the nonlinearities and all the complexities on Javier Stokes, but they are also coupled to the Maxwell equations, which are somewhat simpler but not trivial. Uh, at small spatial scales and fast time scales, uh, all plasmas will show their kinetic nature. You will get to see the length scales typical, for instance, the electron, ion, electron, and ion inertial lengths. You will get to see times like the ion cyclotron or electron cyclotron frequency. So when you get to those scales, you, you have gone too far and your fluid description will not be valid. It will be valid as long as your length scales and time scales are longer than those, okay? So that at the general, as a general remark. Oh, I'm going to go back. Okay. So these are the MHD equations. I can do this really fast because you have seen them many times already. You have the, your continuity equation for mass conservation. If you want to make it simple, you can assume a polytropic. You, you need uh, these equations will not be enough. You need at least one more to close the system. The easy thing with, well, Daniel also mentioned that. I mean, you can assume to be an adiabatic plasma or, or, a, or a 
incompressible or or maybe isothermal or maybe something else with a different gamma. And if you have a, you want to have a more realistic description, then you need an equation, for instance, for temperature, um, putting the heating and the cooling terms in, in equation for the thermal evolution of temperature. Uh, then you have your equation of motion, uh, which include, well, nonlinearities, the pressure gradient, if you want to make it easier, if it's necessary, you need to remember that the pressure is in general a tensor quantity. And then you have a, for a one fluid MHD, you have this magnetic force that gives you, I mean, if you know the magnetic uh, field, then you know from this equation, you will get the dynamics of the flow. Uh, but also the magnetic field oftentimes is not external. The magnetic field uh, is part of the unknowns of your problem. So you need an equation for the magnetic field as well. Uh, <clears throat> oh, okay, I was saying you can have an external force like a, for instance, a gravitational force or a Coriolis force if you are in a rotating reference frame. You, you have viscosity. Uh, in, in this case, uh, the non the non isotropic part of the pressure tensor is here, usually associated to viscosity. And then for the magnetic field, uh, you need a, an equation, and which is the so called induction equation, which is this. So to solve for the magnetic field, you need the velocity field, which is an unknown in the other equation. So here you have equations to get if you if you have a good code or is it, if it's a ge geometrically sufficiently simple problem, then you can get your density, velocity, and magnetic field as a function of position and time. That's uh, this equation is not. Uh, Okay, sort of enter here from the window. What where, where did, does this come from? Actually, this equation is nothing but the curl of the Ohm's law. Uh, Ohm's law, you can think of it as a phenomenological equation. For instance, the left-hand side here is the electric field measure in the reference frame of the fluid. If you are moving with the fluid, at a, at a speed, at a velocity u, then the left hand side altogether is the electric field that you measure there. And so this is just saying that the electric field is proportional to the current density divided by the conductivity, electrical conductivity. Or else, if you instead of conductivity, you want to work with the resistivity, then this is the relationship. Uh, <clears throat> so you can, as I was saying, uh, think of it as a phenomenological equation there's no time here so this is valid at, at any given time but th th this is some something tricky I, I want to show you and in a way Daniela also showed you that and where this actually comes from it's not a new equation from nature uh, you can derive it <clears throat> but I will show so you take the curl of this and the curl of e you use one of Maxwell's equation. You know that the curl of U is proportional to the time derivative of the magnetic field. We, uh, so the curl of this will take you here. So this is the curl of the electric field. The curl of this dot uh, cross product is here. And the curl of J, because J in turn is the curl of B. And the curl of the curl is the Laplacian plus another term, which is zero, because the divergence of B is, of course, zero. <clears throat> so that's sort of a summary of what MHD are. I, I'll skip this, because you already know that the magnetic force can be split into a, two terms, one of, one of which will you can regard as a magnetic tension. I mean, the magnetic fields don't like to be curved. If you curve it, there's a reaction force that then to restore it to, to a straight line. And if you have a bunch of magnetic field lines uh, and try to squeeze it, then it reacts with the magnetic pressure, which is this other term. Uh, and one more uh, um, concept that you can get out of the MHT equations in the limit of zero resistivity. Um, <clears throat> 
plasmas are all very good conductors because of course you have free charges so it, it can conduct electricity very, very easily. That means that the conductivity is very large or else the resistivity is very small. Sometimes you can make it zero. <clears throat> and if you do, then the induction equation reduces to this. And that uh, there's a theorem that tells you what does this mean? This means uh, the frozen, the so-called frozen in condition meaning that if you trace any closed curve in a fluid, just pick up your preferred closed curve. And of course, this closed curve, uh, uh, there are a number, a bunch of magnetic fields crossing this closed curve, these ones. Then uh, let this closed curve move along with the fluid, just let it move with the velocity, vector velocity field. And then all what this equation tells you is that all this bunch of magnetic field lengths will have to go along with the cross curve, meaning that the magnetic fields get frozen into the fluid, but also the other way around, because uh, if you somehow move the magnetic field lengths, then the fluid has to go along as well. So the, the matter and the magnetic field go together if this approximation is true. I mean, for no resistivity. If you allow for a small resistivity, then you can have, for instance, reconnection. <clears throat> Whoa, I skipped. Why do I do this? So there are, of course, a huge number of applications. So we've worked in just a few of them. Um, uh, for instance, instabilities, as uh, we have just heard from Daniela, uh, shocks, wave propagation. Uh, in, in MHD, in compressible MHD, you have the alpha waves, and also you have fast and slow magnetosonic modes. They propagate and transfer energy, and uh, there are a large number of instabilities uh, that transfer energy. And uh, also you can generate shocks, and then you these shocks produce uh, acceleration of particles, heating, uh, as we have heard from Servideo yesterday, for instance. Uh, then an, another important issue in, in astrophysical plasmas <clears throat> is uh, to answer, okay, who put these magnetic fields in all these places, in stars, planets, and, and what's the origin? I mean, nobody believes that you have magnets in the center of stars or planets. So there has to be some physical process that generates magnetic field. And where does the energy to drive this magnetic field increase come from? So um, one possible, well, one of the few possible mechanisms is, is dynamo mechanisms. That is mechanical energy of matter transferred into magnetic fields. So the magnetic field can grow out of the kinetic energy of, of movement of of matter. Uh, another important issue is MHD turbulence, which is a particularly complex, uh, as, as all we understand when, you, when we hear the word turbulence. Uh, <clears throat> you can have hydrodynamic turbulence, and of course, you can have magnetohydrodynamic turbulence. Uh, so the, both the velocity field plus the magnetic field become turbulent. Uh, we have heard some of that in the previous days. And of course, magnetic reconnection. I won't talk too much because Daniela here has uh, took that uh, particular subject in, in more detail. So these are some of the applications I will, I will show you. I guess what I will show you is uh, dyn dynamo. How do you generate? Actually in MHD, I mean, you don't generate magnetic fields. I should say they enhance magnetic fields because uh, I'll go back a bit. Oh, uh, here in the induction equation, you see that the right-hand side is linear in B. So let's assume that initially at time equals zero, B is exactly zero. Then the right-hand side is zero and exactly. And then this tells you that the time derivative of B is zero. So if you don't have a magnetic field, you won't have in the future either. That's true because we are, working under this approximation. So if you don't have a magnetic field, MHD won't generate it for you. But what you can do is to enhance it. Let's assume that you have a small magnetic field. That is what is called usually a seat. I mean, a fluctuation of magnetic field that someone 
put it there. Uh, MHD can enhance uh, this magnetic field for you. <clears throat> so that's what I, I will show as an example. So what, what we do, we have done in the past, uh, I'm an old guy, so I have done this in, during, I don't know, 30 years. Uh, <clears throat> to integrate the MHD equations using a spectral scheme in all three spatial directions. Spectral means in the MHD equations, as you have seen, you have time derivatives, you, and you also have a large number of spatial derivatives. These spatial derivatives, you can solve them uh, with um, um, finite differences. That is, if you assume a derivative is just a ratio of increments, very small. That's one way. This turns out to be dissipative. I mean, you don't want the dissipation, but the numerical code puts it there. Uh, and Or else you can do in a spectral method. I mean, you make a Fourier transformation of all three spatial coordinates, and then derivatives, curls, divergences, and all kind of derivatives in Fourier space are algebraic operations, right? I mean, uh, if you, uh, a divergence is I times K dot the, the, the quantity or, or the curl uh, product if you are dealing with a, with a, with a curl. Uh, um, the Laplacian is minus K square. So it's easier in Fourier space to derivate in, in space. So we transform and do all our derivatives in Fourier space. And then we transfer back to make the time evolution step. Uh, that one might think takes a lot of time, a lot of computing effort, and it does. But since we have uh, the so-called fast Fourier transform, then we can do that Fourier transform back and forth uh, very efficiently. So it turns out to be a good way of uh, <clears throat> integrating uh, things like MHD numerically. Uh, the time integration uh, is performed using a very simple technique, which is second order Runge Kuta, very classical. Of course, you need to make sure that your time step is small enough. Small enough means that you satisfy the, the CFL condition, and with that, you are done. And also, what one does, uh, as most people do, is to run this on on a on a cluster on several machines linked together. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of technical. I can, when you transform <clears throat> in Fourier space, and then you want to 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 do the nonlinear. Uh, if you are, if the equations were linear, then uh, for in Fourier space you, you you can do it pretty easily. But uh, of course, the MHD equations are nonlinear because you have the well, both the, the induction plus the Navier-Stokes equation are nonlinear. So to do the nonlinearities, you transform back when you have to do, if you, for instance, have to do u dot grad u, and, uh, and this is in Fourier space, and this is in Fourier space, you will need to make a convolution product, which is takes a lot of time and memory. And so one doesn't do that. You transform this back into, to physical space and this one too. Uh, and uh, oh, okay, but I mean, what you transform back is this, you compute the gradient of this and, and this and make this product in physical space. But when you do that, uh, there, there are uh, some, what is called aliasing. Some of the modes, Fourier modes from this and this will adapt to produce a spurious effect. So you have to correct for that. Uh, so the two thirds, the aliasing is that if you, yeah, I'll, I'll put it, I'll draw just one direction, for instance, kx. So you have from minus k max over two. And uh, because of course you are dealing with computers, so you have to use a finite number of grid points. And that in Fourier space will give you also a finite number of Fourier modes. <clears throat> uh, so go from here to here. And if you are integrating in a, in a cubic box, then, well, you're going to be not only a finite 
number of modes. Uh, I mean, it will define it because it, it will be a discrete number of modes. <clears throat> but some of these modes we, uh, here will add up to some of the modes here and produce, because this is periodic, will give you a spurious effect. So what you do is to uh, cancel out uh, two thirds means that you, you, you keep two thirds of the modes and the remaining one third, you make it zero. It's just a technique. Uh, otherwise, what you get is it, it's spurious and people know that. And so it's, it's yeah. The recipe is this, the justification will take longer, but. <clears throat> uh, okay, so we, no, no, you have to do, to, to recover the, of, of course, we lose, ever since you discretize the problem, you, you already losing something because I mean, of course the, your fluid is continuous, but uh, you have to do this, otherwise what you get is wrong. So it's a spurious effect. <clears throat> exactly. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yes. You. You have to do it. Um, so this is uh, we we all heard about turbulence well enough, especially the ones that were here yesterday afternoon. Uh, yesterday afternoon, when I counted, there were like 15 people. 10 of them were women. So I wondered where were the men yesterday afternoon? Most of them anyway, some of them were here. So I can see more men now, but some of them are still missing. What is a shame because I'm a man as well and I don't like it. So please, the ICTP and the lecturers have done a big effort. Daniela took three trains yesterday to come here to give a lecture to you. Uh, so the ones I'm, I'm not uh, trying to patronize here to you because you are here, but the, the ones that are not here should be here, uh, especially men, because all women, I, I don't know how many women are in this, in this college. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. 11 are here. So probably all of them. <clears throat> okay. No <laughs> I mean, they, they are very courageous because yesterday they were here uh, during the uh, Sergio was explaining this in, in greater detail and, and they, they stayed there. And, and I guess all they, all of them now know what turbulence is. <clears throat> so I'll skip it. The idea uh, is that uh, you, uh, this is the paradigm of Kolmogorov for hydro turbulence, incompressible hydro turbulence, that you put inject energy into this fluid by stirring at large scales. That is you inject, this is the energy power spectrum, energy per unit weight number as a function of weight number. Uh, you are injecting energy at large scales. For instance, if you have a fluid, you stirring at large scales, that is small k. That's how the energy comes into the system. Then the nonlinear terms, uh, won't dissipate any energy in, in uh, they conserve energy. So what nonlinearities do is to transfer energy from this scale, which is where it enters the system and cascades down to smaller scales where the energy is dissipated, for instance, by viscosity. <clears throat> this picture uh, on the inertial range is a, a, you, to have strong turbulence, you need a scale separation. This injection scale, the macroscopic scale, and this microscopic scales with energy dissipates have to be separated by orders of magnitude if possible. So in, in, in the middle, then you don't have any injection or dissipation. The energy just cascades from large scale to smaller and smaller scales and so on. You can um, visualize this process as if at any K, you identify this K with a given structure of a given diameter. It's diameter being one over K because length is the inverse of web number. <clears throat> then uh, the, the nonlinearity of, of the problem splits eventually in, in a given time that one can est estimate uh, into two uh, smaller vortices. Then instead of one big vortex, now you have two smaller vortices then your length scale is, is one half 
that it used to be. But if the length scale is reduced, then the wave number is increased. So that's how you visualize in physical space this energy transfer in K space. You're, you're going moving energy from small K to large scale. That means uh, large vortices to smaller vortices. And uh, when you uh, do your math elementary mathematics the, and, uh, and say, okay, this, uh, in this inertial range, the, the flow of energy is going to remain constant and it's going to be called epsilon. Like there's an epsilon somewhere. Then you get this famous uh, power spectrum, K to the minus five thirds. The, the epsilon is the uh, injection rate, how much energy per unit time you're injecting which in a stationary regime is the same as how much energy per unit time you're dissipating. And also it has to be how much energy uh, per unit time you're transferring from K to say 2K or larger K. So that's my cartoon for uh, turbulence, hydro turbulence is uh, for MHD is not too different, only that you now have two fields which are turbulent, not just the velocity field, but also the magnetic field. And so what we did many years ago is to, uh, okay, before that, um, there is a theory called mean field theory for dynamos that was developed by uh, Krauss and Rattler many years ago in the 80s, 1980. Um, <clears throat> that tells you from theory that if you want to enhance magnetic, a small amount of magnetic field in a turbulent or, or not turbulent regime, then uh, your fluid, has to be helical, I mean, not any uh, fluid motion, but the fluid motion has to be somewhat helical, meaning that if, if you have vortex, vortex moving like this, then you have, you need to, uh, and of course the vorticity goes then like this, then there has to be a component of the velocity field aligned with the, with the vort vorticity. It, it doesn't need to com be completely aligned, but you have, you need to have a preference. I mean, this fluid has to have helical motions, preferably like this. If you have as many as of these as the other way around, then the total helicity will be zero. And then you won't have a magnetic field enhancement. So that's, that's a theoretical prediction. And, uh, and so what, what we did is to, to do this type of simulations uh, in green, you have the, the references. I can give you the detailed reference if you're interested. Uh, many years ago, like 20 years ago or something. I don't know if you can read this. Is it too, too light? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, in, in, the, in the PowerPoint, you will see it. Sorry, I don't know why it's too light. But, uh, never mind. You, you'll get the information. With Pablo Minini, who, is, who was at the time a, a, a student during his PhD with me and also Mahajan. So I have to show this because I'm here. And if Mahajan were here, then I have to say, show these results. They are pretty old, but uh, I think nonetheless, they are interested, interesting. Um, <clears throat> so what we did is this, we, we have, um, we made simulations of a spectral code in, in this cluster that I just showed. These simulations are 256, uh, if you're doing a spectral, it better be the number of grid points be a power of two that will make it more, it doesn't need to be, but it's gonna be more efficient. So it's 256 cube. Nowadays, I, we can do easily 1024 cube with no problem to, to see whether we, we obtain this. Uh, if you want to go beyond that and do 2048 or even further, then you need a really big computer or a big cluster. It gets very steepy to, to go with larger and large, larger number of grid points. <clears throat> uh, but there, this shows the physics, so I, I'll just show it. So what, what we do is to run a, a hydro uh, part of the, of the code. That means, as I showed, in, I don't need to run a different code to do hydro. Because if my initial magnetic field is zero, then that's all I do. I initiate the magnetic field with zero and run the only code. And, and what that will do is to show a hydrodynamic evolution. So, what, 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 so this in blue is the kinetic part of the energy. So it's 
is u square over two. Uh, it's uh, also an incompressible uh, flow. And what we do is to put a, an external force in the in the in the equation of motion. That external force. Uh, what we want to do is to not just in inject energy, but also elicity. How do we do that? So we our vector field F, the force, is such that its curl is proportional to F. There, there are many ways to do that. There, there, there are the so-called ABC fields that will, will tell you how to how to make curl of a given vector field proportional to F or to minus F, whatever, if you want to inject positive or negative helicity. Uh, so we do that and uh, in all uh, wave numbers within a, a narrow sphere, a sphere in, in Fourier space. In Fourier space, we have Kx, Ky, Kz. So I, I pick up a, a narrow hollow sphere on, at say K equal four, for instance, modulus of K equal four. So you, you have a sphere of unit width so all Fourier modes that have modulus around four, then you put a force in, in that. And if you put it in, in all three directions, then you get sort of an isotropic force, which also introduces not just energy, but also helicity. So uh, say this K equal four is this, the forcing. So you get energy into the system like this. If the equations were linear, you just are going to be raising the velocity, the kinetic energy in this only wave number, but because they are nonlinear, then uh, nonlinearities will put, will scatter energy from this k equal four into larger and smaller wave numbers. And eventually you develop a, a cascade. The magnetic field is still zero. And uh, when you reach the uh, viscous dissipation scale you, you, viscosity is one of the parameters that you put and we put viscosity sufficiently large so that the dissipation takes on before you run out of modes okay i, I said 256 so this is already k equal four five and so on so 256 it has to be somewhere here and your viscosity has to be sufficiently large so that the energy quenches, leaves the system before you run out of modes. Otherwise you get, again, spurious results. So, but one can do that. So you get your uh, Kolmogorov of power law. It's fine, minus five thirds, we, we can check that. The, the Kolmogorov uh, result is robust, robust enough that if, if this were not, Five minus five thirds is not that the Kolmogorov is wrong, but our code is wrong. So, but it does, believe me. And uh, and then we stop the running of the code. We put some seed. I mean, a small amount of magnetic fluctuations. That doesn't matter. You put some fluctuations, small magnet uh, amounts of magnetic field at much larger scales, at the micro scale. Not so large that uh, you hit the viscous scale, but so you put a small, a negligible amount of magnetic energy, say this, much smaller than this. The energy is the integral under the curve. So the total kinetic energy is the integral under the blue curve and a magnetic energy, which is what we are adding now, is the integral and this, the, under this red curve. So, and we run it. <clears throat> Before that, I, I forgot to show, if you want to measure the, the helicity, helicity is um, U times, uh, that is kinetic helicity, not magnetic helicity. Let's say kinetic helicity is the integral of U times vorticity. The magnetic helicity is uh, for A dot B. So per unit volume in any given read point, you compute this. This doesn't have a definite sign. It can be positive or negative, but once uh, you are at the end of your kinet uh, I mean, hydro simulation, 
then you 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 check how much which are the points with when you get an intense value of u dot omega and it's great enough then you have these red uh, spots and same with the negative so you have these green spots and you see the an, an unbalance in helicity so the total helicity i mean you don't need to do the integral you you will see that it's going to be positive <clears throat> so then we put the magnetic energy and let's see what the magnetic energy does when you evolve the 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 code in this second stage so this is uh, so this is the magnetic energy in color this is magnetic energy at the beginning and this is the magnetic energy in the end what i intend to show is that the magnetic energy was at small scales and it, it was mild and uh, uh, as you move in time the magnetic energy grows up in intensity but also in, in it, it has larger scales the structures are larger so <clears throat> and what you wow what you are looking at here this is the the full line is the power spectrum of kinetic energy the the kolmogorov and the, there is the five thirds somewhere here for reference it's minus five, five thirds in these intermediate scales, not when you're injecting the energy or, and it's not when, when you're dissipating. So only in the intermediate scales. And the magnetic energy, which are the curves that almost you don't see, I mean, at, at very little time is like this. It's the seat magnetic field. And as the energy, I don't know, if, can, you, can we turn the lights off? And, I don't know how to do this. Any better or no? Oh, yeah. If I knew how to do that. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is it? All right. Okay. Well, there, uh, I, there, there, this is the seat uh, power spectrum from magnetic energy, and then it grows in time and it grows in time and so on until it reaches what it's called the partition. At sufficiently long times, then you end up with a power spectrum of kinetic and magnetic energy that are more very similar at all scales. So you have k to the minus five thirds, both for the kinetic energy and the magnetic energy. <clears throat> That's what I intended to show here. Let's see if the next one, you can see the next one better. So this, um, this is the same thing. The, uh, in green, this is the kinetic energy power spectrum. In red is the magnetic energy. This is the seed. For reference, uh, the minus five thirds in blue. And this is the total, uh, kinetic energy and magnetic energy in time. This is what's going to happen. And this is the total when you integrate in time. But I, I can an animate this and see how the magnetic, especially the red curve, grows from almost nothing to equipartition. That's what this simulation shows. Um, so this again, total energy as a function of time. Uh, kinetic energy is here almost, well, it's not constant, but uh, because part of the energy that uh, the magnetic uh, field obtains comes from the, well, all of the energy of the magnetic field comes from here. The external driver puts energy into kinetic energy and then kinetic energy puts energy into the magnetic energy until they reach a partition. Uh, and here you have a first stage of fast growing magnetic energy. This is what is called the kinematic stage of the dynamo. You can do a linear calculation because the magnetic field is very small. So uh, at very small magnetic field, you can make a linear calculation as I was saying, and, and find that the solution is an exponentially growing uh, <clears throat> magnetic energy as a function of time. We did that for different values of the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number uh, here was like 100, 300, very small. 
if you want to have real turbulence, you have to have a, at least a few thousand. But this is what we did at the time. And, and this is, uh, so it's a numerical confirmation of what uh, the people doing mean field theory was predicting at the time. If I do the same uh, numerical exercise, but um, let's say I don't drive at K equal four, which is very large scale. It is, it's one fourth of the size of the cube. Uh, let, let me drive at smaller scales, K equal 10. So the, my driving is at intermediate scales. What changes? So the, the peak of uh, the kinetic energy power spectrum is here, not, not here now. The seed is the same. So let's run this. What, what, what is it different from before? The magnetic uh, power spectrum grows, but notice that at, very, at the larger scales of the size of the system, you now have larger magnetic energy than kinetic energy. And, and this is a log plot. So that means uh, this is like two orders, two orders of magnitude in, uh, larger than this. So if you, if you have a bad resolution instrument and you look this at the very large scales, you see magnetic energy and not too much motion of the fluid. So you, you, you might expect this magnetic field to be in a sort of a, an equilibrium. And if you look for equilibrium of magnetic fields, you have the so-called uh, force-free solutions. The MHD equations have a, if you look for equi equilibrium solutions, they, you have these ones, for instance. J parallel to B. If J is parallel to B, the magnetic force is equal to zero. And it, if the velocity is negligible as it is, then uh, you can check that the right-hand side of your MHD equations are almost zero. So it is an equilibrium. And the force-free solutions are observed, for instance, in the corona of the sun. There are a lot of structures that if you compute the force-free solution, uh, out of what, what are called magnetograms, which is the information of the distribution of magnetic field on the surface of the sun, then you can compute the, the force-free extrapolation in the upper part. And uh, so here you can then show that uh, a turbulent system that like the corona might show at very large scales, things that don't look as turbulence at all. I mean, this, these structures are sitting there for days no one would said this is turbulent, but the turbulence is the one that brought the magnetic field there. And if you look at smaller scales, now if you have a better telescope and you look at much smaller uh, scales, both for magnetic field and velocity field, then you eventually you will get to see this. I mean, here the magnetic energy is comparable to the kinetic energy in the fluctuations at these sufficiently small scales. And then you realize that this is turbulent. I mean, if you manage to compute the kinetic and magnetic spectrum, it will be minus five thirds. So this, um, the microphysics of, of this, it's hard to tell, but it might well be turbulent. Only that at large scales, you only see the, I mean, this tail of magnetic energy. Now I will move to, um, I don't know, I should finish in like 10 minutes or Any, anybody's counting time? 10 minutes, okay, thank you. Uh, to multi-fluid, because uh, Daniela already explained that, I, I will go again, but uh, I don't have too much time here. anyway. Uh, if you want a description of multi-fluid, uh, then there's the book of Goldstone and Rutherford that's one of them. Let's call S to any species. Most of the time it's going to be electrons and protons, but you can have um, alpha particles. You can have, uh, I don't know, uh, oxygen or carbon ions. It depends on where, where in, in the universe you are sitting. Uh, you might have another kind of <clears throat> charged particles. And you can also, of course, have neutral particles as well. So the, the idea of a multifluid description is to add more physics to just one fluid MHD, which is the one we have seen. Uh, more physics means that you are going into the regime of kinetic physics. No, you don't get there, but uh, you, you, you can obtain some of the effects 
of kinetic physics. I mean, of course, you won't have a, a distribution function per species, so you you don't get all that information. But uh, I'll, I'll show you what what the physical effects you get if you assume that for any species you have the you, you know your set of, of fluid equations like uh, continuity for species s that is the number of s particles is is uh, it's constant to assume this you are you are assuming that you don't have for instance electron positron collisions or you are not ionizing or recombining species because in that case the number of any given particle species it might not be conserved. You don't have any of that. So you have a mixture of particles and there are no processes that transmute one into another. So the number of S particles is conserved. The equation of motion for S particles, MS is the mass of this particular kind of particles. The AQ is, is, a, is their charge, electrical charge. You have a velocity field for this particular species and a, a pressure a viscous effect and this is a um, daniela show this is the exchange of linear momentum from space uh, from species s it, uh, to uh, to the species s prime it's a collisional exchange of linear momentum and uh, of course if you are studying your species s you have to consider collisions with all other species so there is some summation of uh, over the targets that you are considering and a simple of, of course this is a simplification of how you can take into account the uh, collisional momentum exchange in collisions the okay this is the relative velocity of between the two species that are colliding this is the mass of the particles that you're considering if they're um, number per unit volume and this is the the new s s prime is the collisional frequency between species s and s prime which should be given somehow because or 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 else you can compute it for a more kinetic a more basic description <clears throat> and uh, once you have all these uh, species and you somehow know what their dynamics is going to be then of course these charged particles will generate uh, a, a charge density at any given point and time which is just the sum of all the this is the individual charge times the that per unit volume number of particles per unit volume this is your charge density which is almost zero because of of the quasi neutrality condition which is very strong for non-relativistic plasmas, if, if your all your species move at, at velocities much smaller than the speed of light, then uh, the net charge density is almost zero. Basically, the electrons, which are much lighter, move almost instantaneously to quench any charge imbalance <clears throat> to satisfy this. And uh, same for the electric current density. This is a current, uh, this is the charge, sorry, for an individual particle times the number of them per unit volume times the speed. This is the charge flow for each species. You sum over all species and you get your J. And this is a Maxwell equation. We are neglecting here the displacement current. Again, because uh, if, if you are dealing with non-relativistic problems, then the displacement current can be also neglected and uh, <clears throat> so if you if you your multi-fluid let's stop at two fluids electrons and protons then you have uh, this is dimensionless the same same equation but dimensionless i took away dimensions i consider a, a problem of a given scale l0 whatever scale you decide a, a, and a density particle density n0 and an alpha and speed, you, you have a given average magnetic field B0, so you can compute a, a constant alpha and velocity. So you take away uh, units, uh, velocities by dividing by this and the length by this and times, of course, from L0 and VA, you get something with time units. So you take away all units and you end up with this equation for the dynamics of ions your ion species this is the electric and magnetic force 
the pressure and the the this exchange of momentum turn into because it's uh, proportional to the difference of velocities it turn into the current density because the current density for two species is uh, the charge of electrons number of electrons per unit volume velocity of electrons <clears throat> uh, plus uh, the charge of uh, protons number of protons velocity of protons but because the charge is the same and quasi neutrality tells you uh, that ne is equal to the the charge the net net charge density is this plus this right so the density of protons and electrons are the same so you assume this here and you end up with uh, your current density will be E times N. N is both protons and electrons. And your exchange of momentum was already proportional to this relative speed between the only two species. And so that exchange of momentum can be written in terms of J, which is already here. And of course, the, the momentum that the protons lose because of this interaction is, is exactly the one that electrons gain. And uh, it, around here, you have a few dimensionless numbers. One of them is the ion inertial length, dimensionless, because I take away dimensions by using L0. The beta of the plasma is the ratio between the thermal, thermal uh, pressure divided by the magnetic pressure and the resistivity which is the, a dimensionless version of it. Actually, this is the inverse of the Reynolds number. Uh, if you add these two equations for the two species, then you end up with this one fluid MHD. Notice that, which is, you can recognize the terms only for this. There's a curl of J, which is weird. But if you do this um, rigorously, that, that's what you get. Epsilon E is the electron inertia length. It is the epsilon that I showed before, but multiplied by the square root of the mass ratio. Uh, this is very small because the electron mass is very small. So if you are ready to neglect the mass of electrons, then uh, this goes to zero and this term you can forget about it. And you get one fluid MHT for massless electrons. Uh, <clears throat> also, if you neglect the mass, this is the fluid flow, the, the bulk flow, which is a mixture of the two velocities of the two species. But again, see if the, the electron mass is negligible, then you this goes away and your bulk flow will be this, the proton flow. We are used to that. And uh, so this is will be the last slide to show you the, uh, that the Ohm's law, is actually nothing but the equation of motion for electrons. So this is the equation of motion for electrons that I showed before, only, only that now uh, the mass ratio, uh, I'm just calling it mu, it's a very small number. Uh, and now I don't neglect the mass, I just assume that it's small, but I retain it just in case. So, this is the bulk, the fluid velocity in terms of the velocity of each species. This is the current density, again, in terms of the relative velocities. And then if I want to forget, okay, I have the, this two fluid plasma, but I, I don't care how many electrons, how many protons, I, I just to want to use a fluid description. So what you can do from these two equations is to obtain UE and UI in terms of these fluid quantities the the bulk flow and j so you 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 can derive u i and u e as a function of u and j and then you replace and forget about the velocity of protons or or electrons you only have a one one vector flu velocity flow and one current density running through the the plasma <clears throat> And so you replace this in, in this equation of motion. And uh, 
now you can make assumptions. Let's assume that the electron mass is negligible. So mu goes to zero, then this uh, acceleration of electrons goes to zero. So there's no electron inertia anymore. Electrons uh, instantaneously adapt to a force equilibrium because if this is zero, what this equation tells you that all the forces of electrons instantaneously balance one another. And so you end up with this. This is the so-called generalized Ohm's law. You have the electron pressure as one of the terms for this extended Ohm's law. And here, J cross B term here uh, in the in Ohm's law is the whole, whole term. And, the, and but you can neglect this also as long as the, you're dealing with scales much larger than the ion inertial length. So your epsilon also goes to zero. Your ion inertial length is very small, so you don't want to take care of that. And so epsilon, if epsilon goes to zero, then you end up with, with Ohm's law. So it's not a phenomenology. It, it, it can be phenomenologically introduced if we want to do it that way, but it's, it's, it's an equilibrium of forces of electrons. So I can, I'll, I'll stop here. I can talk about this in, okay, so in the I next lecture tomorrow. Act as the chairman of your session. Any yeah, questions? Sure. Thank you. Question? Thank you. Otherwise, let's thank the speaker. Now, I have a question to ask all of you. Do you want to delay your lunch by 15 minutes and I tell you the solution of that problem we proposed? Mm -hmm. huh? Okay. Sure. So we'll do that. And, uh, and the reason.